Cultural waves seem to be shifting. If you believe that you should share your faith with someone, try to convert them, that's viewed by 60% of Americans to be extremist. Society says Christians are the problem. There's some challenging realities that we have to address. What will the future look like? If we don't rise to the occasion, in 10 years, it's gonna be a different kind of church. Why researchers say good faith is the solution. On today's 700 Club Interactive, Welcome to the show. For millions of people who grew up in church, Christianity has become background noise, and this noise can be safely ignored. They're not exactly rejecting God, and yet they find church boring and Christians irrelevant. David Kinneman's latest research also shows another group of Americans think Christians are not just irrelevant, they're extremist. This has many of us asking, how can Christians be a positive force in a world so increasingly hostile to our faith? Not so long ago, these people were seen as the extremists, rifle brandishing ISIS militants, the Paris and Brussels attackers, the Boston Marathon bombers. Today, however, it's these people who increasingly wear that label. Do you believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven? You're an extremist. Have you ever prayed for someone you don't know? Extremist. Believe marriage is meant to be between one man and one woman? Extremist. Many people of faith are finding it harder than ever to live out their convictions. They feel that religion is being pushed to the margins. Best-selling authors David Kinnaman and Gabe Lyons say, don't despair, it's still possible to be a faithful Christian in the public square. They show you how in a new book, Good Faith, being a Christian when society thinks you're irrelevant and extreme. Well, David Kinnaman joins us now. He's the president of the Barna Group and co-author of Good Faith. And David, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Gordon, for having me. Why, have, why, why has American culture become hostile to Christians? Well, I think what's happening is we're living in a very religiously plural culture. And so the new religion is this sort of vacuum at the center. It, it's like we don't want to have any religion at all dominating the airwaves. Yeah, let's and, check none. And so yeah, let's just have no religion. In fact, that's the fastest growing faith group in America is the religiously unaffiliated, the nuns, N-O-N-E-S. And uh, so I think people are sort of like, well, Christianity's had its time. Let's push it to the margins. Uh, we see sort of the negative effects of religion. 42% of Americans say that people of faith are actually part of the problem we're having in our culture today. Uh, and so let's, let's sideline them, let's marginalize them. In the past, a problem of irrelevance was that faith just wasn't that relevant. People you know, could have been a lifelong churchgoer in the past, but they don't attend anymore. The, the new issue is extremism, because if you can label something as extremist, you can put it to the side. You can try to legislate around it. Well, you can also legislate against it if exactly. it's extremist. Uh, and that actually con concerns me. And, and one of my concerns is that it seems to be targeted specifically at Christianity. If you, if you just take Christian out of whatever statement is being made and, and insert Muslim, it, 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 that would then be attacked, that, that you're going after Islam uh, and that's not proper, or you know, Buddhist, or hit, n name any other religion. Uh, it just seems to be okay to trash Christianity uh, but it's not okay to go after these other religions. Yeah, I've been uh, at Barna Group now for 21 years, almost two decades, and the very first press release that I wrote uh, was, Christianity has a strong positive image despite fewer active participants. You know, your memory for these early things that you do in, in your <laughs> professional life, right? Uh, but, but Christianity had a strong positive image. And, and to be honest, uh, you, you know, we've interviewed like a million interviews over the course of the 20 years that I've been at Barna. You know, it's an amazing company. We get to look at a lot of different subjects. and. Part of the reason I wrote this book was because I am actually really surprised at the speed with which uh, Christianity's image has changed. And not just that, well, we can just sort of ignore it because it's, you know, been there, done that. But the degree to which now, um, you know, Christianity is being sidelined, it's the, the active, you know, sort of marginalization of Christians and this idea that we're just social extremists. If you try to share your faith, that 60% of Americans would say that's extremist. Or if you were to pray in public for a stranger, um, you know, we should still do those things. Uh, we're, we're actually doing this project to try to give Christians permission to be irrelevant and extreme as Christ calls us to be. Uh, and, and so that, but but well, I want to get back to the point, why the double standard? Because it, there does seem to be a double standard. Uh, and, 
you know, just anyone who, who stands up to say what Islam is doing to women in Saudi Arabia is wrong. Uh, if, if you were to do that, I think you would be labeled extremist in, in by, by making that statement. Right. Um, even though the very facts on the ground in Saudi Arabia, you can't vote, you can't drive, you can't. I mean, there are all kinds of things women can't do in that culture. Um, why, why is it? Why, why the double standard? Well, I think we're living in an era when, you know, this sort of media dominates the way stories are being told. And, um, and this generation doesn't really understand the, the sort of the way in which sort of these realities occur. And if you think about the sort of like our, our spiritual, the spiritual side to our world, like the, the our adversary can't create anything. He can only deceive people. He can only distort things. And it feels like there's tons of distortions that are entering, to our, entering into our equation. Like 89% say you shouldn't criticize someone else's life choices. So I think the double standard is such that, you know, we're living in a spiritually contentious time. As, as human beings have always done, but it's being, you know, it's being focused now on Christianity in North America because we have had a lot of cultural power and that power is now slipping away. And, and so the, 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 you know, the government and other kinds of uh, forces of power, even social media and the way the next generation views Christianity is, is, is changing the power, it's changing the way Christians have, have, have uh, exercised power. All right. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually thinking there's a new term arising that Orthodox Christianity, uh, and I never thought that would ever come out of me, but ortho, you know, that you actually believe the Bible. Yeah. And, and if you're Orthodox in your beliefs, uh, is there a, what, what do you do with the temptation to sort of uh, hunker down? To, to pull back in and say, okay, if the culture is going to go this way, let them go, and and we're, we're just going to, I don't know, go to the mountain or try to find some hidden valley to dwell in. Uh, what, what do you do with that? Well, I think, you know, certainly this idea of being separate from the world, uh, some Christian communities, the Amish come to mind, have chosen that path, and that is one path to faithful living in the world today, is just to be separate from the world. For most of us as, as believers, uh, you know, in today's cities and contexts, like that's not really the option we're likely to choose. And so we think that there is a way to, to be faithful, to be orthodox, to hold to these historic truths. Uh, and we actually think that so many of these things will turn out to be a dead end for today's culture, that, that the ideas about sex and sexuality, the ideas about how it is that we live as flourishing human beings, uh, that, that these all need to be rethought and that millennials, especially, but, but all of our culture is waiting for these deeper answers, these orthodox answers. Um, uh, when, when, when do you think the culture is going to wake up that, well, actually, we've been here before uh, as a species, mm -hmm. uh, and all you have to do is look at Greek history, Roman history, and you'll find this pansexual, you'll find this kind Pleasure of... Pleasure-seeking. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and Christianity actually survived, and not just survived, but thrived, and then became the dominant thought that let's not do that, uh, let's not give in to that, let's live a righteous and holy life. Well, it's hard to predict based on the trends when people will wake up to that. I mean, there can be economic crisis or you know health crisis or other kinds of things. We, we see that people individually wake up to those things in our research, that spiritual transformation happens you know, every day uh, across the country in individual lives, maybe not, you know, sort of cultural wide. And so that's part of what each family and church leader and Christian could aspire to is that we're not called to change the whole culture. We are called to be faithful in those individual relationships that God has called us to be transformational in. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I've been thinking about as a researcher is what kind of church will we have in a hundred years? How can we build media companies and, and schools and colleges and you know, structures that can, can last in this new kind of exile type experience because we're not the majority anymore. So how do we live in a religiously plural you know, culture? I think Daniel in the Old Testament is a great example of someone who gives us a faithfulness under pressure, serves as essentially the secretary of state for three different regimes, mm -hmm. uh, is, is capable of, of he's, he's more Babylonian than the Babylonians, but he's faithful to Yahweh. And so I think this faithfulness, this being countercultural, serving the needs of our, of, of our communities, building great businesses, being the very best neighbors, those are some of the things that could define us in this era of skepticism. That is a good point. The church in 100 years in America will likely be Hispanic. That's right. Um, the demographics are pretty unavoidable. And there are incredible signs of growth 
uh, both among Catholic Hispanics uh, as well as among Catholic Hispanics who are converting to Protestantism. Uh, and so this, we can have great hope uh, you know, in, in the, the, the Hispanic Christian future in America. That's one, one area that um, is really growing. All right, well, the book, Good Faith, Being a Christian When Society Thinks You're Irrelevant and Extreme. Uh, David has put together a wonderful book, and I encourage you to get it. It's available uh, wherever uh, books are being sold. We want to keep this conversation going, so immediately following the show today, some of our producers will be going live on Facebook, and they want to hear from you on this question. How can we be effective Christians? when society thinks we're irrelevant or extreme. And David, thank you. Thanks so much. All right. Pleasure to be here. God bless you. Terry, over to you. Coming up, a traveling evangelist in Uganda meets Enoch. I didn't know he was a witch doctor, so he told me, could you please tell me about the Lord? Within about 40 minutes, he said, I want to give my life to the Lord. So how did his village, known for its witchcraft, respond? Find out after this. In the African nation of Uganda, spiritual warfare is real, and witch doctors control entire villages. As Steve Little shows us in the latest Under the Radar, they're no match for the gospel of Jesus Christ. These are the stories of believers stepping up and stepping outside church walls, serving their community, not looking for attention, simply loving the way Jesus did. This is Under the Radar. Peter was a traveling evangelist in Uganda. Enoch was a witch doctor in one of the most notorious villages in the country. This one particular village and a district in the whole country that had a lot of witchcraft. Everybody that talked about it knew that you know, people that live there, they are evil people, that they would bewitch you and you would die in, in, a, in a short time. One day, God told Peter to preach the gospel in that village. So, what happened when the witch doctor met the evangelist? I introduced myself to him. I said, I'm here to tell people about Jesus. But I didn't know he was a witch doctor. So he told me, could you please tell me about the Lord? Within about 40 minutes, he said, I want to give my life to the Lord. I said, well, that's, this is quick. And so I gave him a, a, we prayed together. Soon, Enoch led his wife and daughter to the Lord. So Peter started a Bible study in his house. And in a period of one year, we had about 35 people that had uh, you know, given their lives to the Lord. You know what happened next. On the 25th of December, 2008, and the church was started then. Today, the church started by the evangelist and the one-time witch doctor helps fight spiritual darkness in Uganda. But that's a story for the next time. This is Steve Little from Under the Radar. Evidence that even in the most difficult circumstances, the power of God is able to pre prevail and churches are being born. We, we need to recognize that we're in the greatest revival the church has ever seen. This is an amazing time. The final ingathering of the Gentiles. Uh, what the Apostle Paul prophesied is happening today. Uh, and, and we need to rejoice at what's going on around the world. Boy, that is for sure. It's exciting to see that. Good thing to remember on the heels of our own culture going through transition, right? Well, every day, Taylor put his life on the line. He was a deep sea diver who had to provide for his family. But even though his job was dangerous, it still didn't put enough on the table to eat. Seven-year-old Dido waits on the shores of this island in southern Thailand, wondering if this is the day his father will come home. I miss my daddy a lot. Mommy and I always pray for him. I wish daddy were here every day. Dido's father dives for a living, using a single hose attached to a compressor. He must swim up to 130 feet below the surface and stay underwater for an hour. He's looking for sea cucumbers, an Asian delicacy. Many have died or been paralyzed doing this. Taloy says he's been lucky so far. He earns just $4 a day for the risky job. If I hadn't taken the job, my family would have nothing to eat. There are no other jobs here. I still have to borrow money for food. 
Back home, Taloy's wife tries to repair their fishing nets. They own a small fishing boat, but with no motor. Catching larger fish to sell is almost impossible. Every time my husband leaves, we wonder if he will come home safely. We don't want him to go, but we need the money. The couple realized they needed to ask for help. That's when CBN's Orphan's Promise started a preschool in their community. There, the children enjoy healthy lunches. Mawe even works part-time there and is bringing in a little extra money for the family. Because of Orphan's Promise, my children have not missed a single meal, and I love teaching the other children Bible stories and songs. Then we were able to help Taloy stay closer to home by giving him a boat engine and some new nets. I am able to catch so many fish and crabs. I can buy enough food for my family for every meal. Thank you, CBN. If you're a 700 Club member, I hope you can see in that story how your kindness, your compassion, your generosity touched an entire family. We want to say thank you. Those are hallmarks of CBN Partners activities around the world. And if you're not a 700 Club member, you're missing out on it. But you can join today. In fact, you can join right now. It's 65 cents a day, $20 a month. How do you do that? You call our toll-free number. It's 1-888-777-1999. Or you can log on to 700 Club Inter interactive.com. Just say, I want to join the 700 Club. I'm telling you about a general membership. There are multiple levels you can join at, and they'll be happy to share that with you. When you do, we want to say thank you by sending you Victory Through Life Storms. This is Pat's latest DVD, and you're going to love it. It's filled with wise counsel from him in his 80-some years of walking with the Lord, facing many difficulties, and finding victory in God's place in his life and his power in his life. We want you to have that. There are also some amazing testimonies on there that you will really be touched and inspired by. So call now, care about others, and we want to bless you and say thank you by sending you this. Gordon? Well, still ahead, she was ashamed. It was itching to the point of practically seeing blood. I wasn't going out. It was just too embarrassing. And she couldn't do anything about it. Hear what gave her back her life after this. Sandra Nazaro's skin was, well, embarrassing. The young mother had rashes and blisters that covered her body and forced her to stay indoors. And no matter how many creams and meds the doctors prescribed, nothing worked until she heard Gordon give a word of knowledge. It was itching to the point of practically seeing blood. I wasn't going out. Uh, it was just too embarrassing. In 2006, Sandra Nazaro went to the doctor to find relief for a severe rash on her legs. I was explaining the symptoms to the doctor, and he just told me, uh, well, it's a form of eczema. He said it, it, it can just gradually come about. And um, the best he can do was to prescribe some creams for me. The over-the-counter cream the doctor prescribed didn't work. That summer, new symptoms appeared. I noticed blisters on my hands. So went back to the doctor and he said, yes, this is another form of eczema. It comes out in the heat. Her doctor prescribed more creams. The doctors were pretty negative. Um, they just insisted that that's all they can do and that I would have to live with it. It was too self-conscious. It was too embarrassing. I, I, I wouldn't do anything. I felt like I was in a little bubble hiding. Sandra lived with the itching and embarrassment for years. During this time, she started praying and reading her Bible. Matthew 626 says, I take care of the birds in the air, the flowers. How much more will I take care of you? That kept coming around in my head. And I said, well, I know he loves me. So I, I'll just keep praying. That's that's all I can I can do. Then one day, she was watching the 700 Club. Then the word of knowledge came on, and Gordon started talking about someone with eczema. Skin condition, and it's um, uh, causing uh, bubbles on the skin. It's like uh, they're filled with fluid, and, and God is healing that. He's taking that all away from you right now. In Jesus' name, Thank you, Lord. be healed. Amen. I kind of 
jumped up and down claiming it. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Out of everyone that was watching, you paid attention to me. I knew God was doing something for me as soon as I started feeling the tingling on my legs. I, I knew it was, it was happening. He was healing me. Uh, maybe it wasn't right away, but he was working. Within six months, all of her symptoms of eczema were completely gone. My confidence came back. <laughs> I was not embarrassed anymore. I was very excited. Sandra offers encouragement to anyone waiting on God to heal them. I would say, don't give up. <laughs> Certainly pray um, and talk to Jesus. He's, he's the best person to go to. He's, um, he's your creator. He's, he's a big God. I know God heals today because he healed me. And he can heal you too. We've received some prayer requests on Facebook. And before we pray today, we just want to share those with you so that we can all pray together as family. Ingrid writes, please pray for me. The doctors found some nodules in my thyroid and I will have a biopsy on June 7th. Please pray it isn't cancer and for complete healing and peace of mind. And then Julie says, my one month old grandson Cooper is going for testing for cystic fibrosis today. Please pray all the tests are negative. And we have one from Darius. He writes, please pray for the refugees coming into Germany as we work to serve them and make Jesus known to them so they can accept him as their savior. I am a voluntary missionary with YWAM. And let's pray and realize that God pays attention to you. He knows the very hairs on your head. He has every one of them numbered. You know, if he cares for the birds of the air, so Jesus said, if he cares for them, how much more does he care about you? How much more are you valuable to him? All we have to do is believe that and dwell in that and understand that. And then everything else comes into place. So we're going to pray. We're going to pray for these requests uh, and we're going to pray for you. And so join with us in prayer. And this wonderful verse, if two or more agree, it shall be done by our Father in heaven. So Terry and I are going to agree. The audience is going to agree. You join in and let's agree together and see what God will do. Let's pray. Lord, we just lift the needs, the ones that have been written in right now. We just pray for Ingrid and we just ask for complete healing for her and for Cooper. You just treasure him. And so be with them now, Lord God. Let your presence surround them and be all over them and in them and stretch forth your hand to do miracles and wonders, signs and wonders, miracles on the earth, Lord God. Let your will mm -hmm. be done on earth as it is in heaven. And now for the refugees coming into Germany, for those in, in Greece, Macedonia, for all of them, we just ask that you would reveal yourself to them. Open their eyes, Lord God, that they may see. Open their ears, that they may hear your voice. Give them a heart of understanding so that they would turn and find salvation with you. And now for those who are watching, we just declare over them that you're the answer to every human need. You provide for all. You show no partiality. You're not a respecter of persons. You want to come to them right now and love them. So Jesus, manifest yourself right in their presence now and open their eyes that they can see. Open their ears so they can turn and you would heal them. Terry, you've got a word. Mm -hmm. Lord, I just want to pray that those who are hearing right now would also become obedient, that Holy Spirit, you would breathe that fresh life into their hearts that says, I want to follow Jesus. God, give strength and courage where it's needed and faith, faith to believe for those who have stood on shallow ground and rocky ground, Lord. Just pray that you'd set their feet on the rock of Jesus Christ. Uh, there's a woman named Margie. You're seeing flashes of light. You've already been diagnosed by an eye doctor. Uh, with um, uh, detached retina. 
and you're concerned about going blind and Jesus just wants to call you by name and let you know that he's healing that. You're not going to go blind. You're going to see perfectly mm -hmm. in Jesus name. Amen. amen and amen. Don't forget right after the show today, we'll be live on Facebook and we want to hear from you on the topic. How can we be effective Christians when society thinks we're irrelevant? Just go to Facebook.com. Well, that's all the time we have. God bless you. We'll see you again tomorrow.